Um, I'm really pleased to now um, introduce um, Bernard Fisher. Um, so he's a, he has nearly 40 years research experience of air quality, mo air quality modeling. Um, he's a former chair of the IQM and he was elected the Institute's first president in 2019. Um, so he's well placed to talk to um, 20 years of the IQM. So thanks very much, Bernard, and over to you. Ryan, um, thank you very much, Ethne. Well, it's 20 years since the IQM was founded in November 2002. And of course, the aim of the Institute is to improve air quality. But when you look at the Institute, there are really two pillars on which it is, uh, uh, it is based. Uh, there's the legal requirements, uh, the legislation of the last 25 years, and then uh, the, there's the science of air quality management, how do you deal with emissions, modeling and, and measurements. And the trouble is, and perhaps the reason why the Institute exists is because the legislation is not always clear as to what you're supposed to do. And the science is not always present. So for one to carry things out in a, in a simple and a, an effective way. So as an example, when is a number not a number? It's when it's a limit value or a target or an objective or a guideline or what we have of assessment level. And uh, I would argue that all of these metrics would be much better if, we, if, they were, if they were fuzzy, defined in terms of fuzzy sets instead of a sharp threshold. But you can't really imagine putting a fuzzy set into legislation or carrying out uh, assessments. So you have to adopt, what should we say, simpler, more um, manageable ways of getting around some of the difficulties that we, we face in our air quality assessments. And I would argue that's what the Institute has has achieved its main achievement over the last 20 years is providing guidance to provide way, a way forward. So for example, we have guidance on the assessment of air quality impacts on nature conservation sites, and the guidance contains um, uh, advice on the key issues that one should be looking at. There've been other guidance on odor smells for example very important for some people but really rather a, a cinderella subject compared with other air quality issues and uh, as there's been guidance on construction sites and and dealing with mineral mineral dusts the um the guidance which probably had the greatest effect on in public has been the guidance on uh, land use planning and development control. And the table in the guidance, which is probably has the greatest effect, is the table 6.3, which is all to do with um, significance or uh, the discussion, let's so say, around significance. And this is the way that uh, within the Institute we've dealt with the questions of uncertainty and dealing with with thresholds. The other recent guidance that I would commend to you is the guidance on indoor in on indoor air. And I hope that though the working group doesn't exist at the moment, I hope indoor air will be carried forward, particularly given the present public interest in um, in what well, should we say the limits to you know social housing in this country really it's 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 become a bit of a scandal. So let's do a little change of direction. Christine's already mentioned Ian McCrae, who was um, one of the founding members of the institute. His interest was always uh, emissions from motor vehicles. Christine's already mentioned routes to clean air. Ian would have been very interested in the talks at Roots to Clean Air, which as Christine mentioned, was a live meeting at long last, meeting real people. One of, there were several things came out of this, questions to do with gross emitters, which we might hear more about, emissions from tires and urban, and urban ammonia. And uh, it's a reminder to us not to believe every 
thing that we get in, you know, in theoretical guidance. You know, there is real issues about what are the real, what are the real emissions from motor vehicles. As Christine's already mentioned, uh, because of Ian, we, we have an award every year and Julian Mann won it this year and I uh, hope he's listening today. And uh, his, his, his essay referred to um, climate change, which I think will be an increasing in involvement of the Institute from now on. Now, I'll just mention a few other activities. I was at this stage going to sort of just a bit like Christine uh, mention people who made big contributions to the Institute for Air Quality Management, but I probably would leave one or two people out and fend them. So I, all I can give is a general, a general thanks. We have in terms of activities, the Dispersion Models User Group, what a name for an activity. It must confuse some people, but this year, next year, rather 2023, we'll be having a, a measurement, uh, real live measurement meeting, uh, perhaps, uh, which is a, it's, it's a good thing to get the balance right between the modelers and the people who do measurements. Christine's already mentioned the, the forum we had on PM 2.5. I've given you there the um, YouTube um, reference point and I would recommend you listening to listening or hear, uh, looking at it I'd like to see from that a position statement coming apart from our guidance we produce position statements which are sort of one or two page um, uh, accounts of how we think you, you could deal with deal with issues and I um, let, let's hope we could get something on, I mean, because people don't quite know how to deal with PM 2.5 guideline. And in addition, we've had a series of webinars during our, our, COVID, our COVID times. So the position statements are another, hopefully, uh, contribution and help to our members. And uh, I've written down mitigation, because that's one of the, um, one of the uh, activities that's arisen out of um, out of the position statements. Now, Christine has already mentioned our, uh, our working groups, and uh, I was going to just think a little bit about the future coming out of these working groups. So the, the competency-based membership working group is an attempt to try and encourage members to, in addition to when they apply for membership, in addition for giving experience and who they work for and so on, try and encourage them to develop their skills and in their professional development. There's modeling, there's a modeling guidance working group, which is probably be very, uh, when it produces a report will probably be controversial, but we look forward to that. And then there's the climate change working group. And I'd like to emphasize here that the way we're structured now is in a, in a instead of having a, everything coming down from the committee, we've got a distributed organization. And I hope that this will mean that members don't feel they have to be on the committee in order to make a contribution. If you've got an idea, an issue or some something you want to contribute, I hope you'll go straight to come forward and, and offer your Offer your, offer, your, your, offer your services. And uh, I hope that's going to evolve out of the early, early careers work as well. Anyway, climate change is going to be the, uh, an issue of the next, um, uh, what is it, next 20, nearly 30 years. So um, here we have the, uh, if we're to believe, if we are to believe the, um, the, the country is going to head towards net zero. These, this is a diagram of the future green uh, global warming potential from emissions in the, uh, from, the U, from the UK, heading towards 20, 2050. Now, this trend in, uh, uh, in, in uh, greenhouse gas emissions will inevitably have a major effect on uh, air, air pollution emissions and will be almost eliminating combustion sources. So here's a diagram showing an estimate of the, uh, the health risk impact of um, uh, air pollution out to 2050 in 
some in some way. And what's the real the real crux is to ensure that we align the air quality policies with climate change policies. And I, I would argue that there are two ways of, of doing this. Uh, there's a qualitative way, which is when you've got some new process, is a, you can think about a traffic light system where you, you look at what the contributions would be from air to from the measure on air quality, whether it be green if it's favorable, red if it's not favorable, and similarly, some sort of uh, traffic light system for um, global climate impacts. And uh, this is something I, you'll see emerge from the, our, uh, the organization we've been working with, Environmental Protection UK. They're producing their updated guidance and they will show um, how, how this can be done in many process areas. So that's the qualitative approach. And I, I just wanted to throw this in, which was a, well, well, a suggestion towards the quantitative approach. If you put the trends in and what you might think are the, the air quality effects and the climate change effects and you scale them appropriately, you find they both go down towards 2050 in, in roughly the same sort of way. So I'd argue in a rough sort of way that you can, you can attribute, uh, you can, relate one attributable death to a certain amount of uh, carbon dioxide equivalent, well, in this case, 12 and a half thousand, thousand tons. And this might be a quantitative way of um, trying to relate uh, and align our, our future uh, on air quality with the future to do with, with, with climate change. Now, I'm going, to, I'm going to finish there, but I just wanted to add a, couple more points, which was really to emphasize that uh, we are a small we're a professional body. Uh, we compared with many others, we're a small professional body. But just because I mean, one of the advantages of being small is that everyone has a can make a, a bigger, a bigger contribution. So I hope I can encourage you uh, as many as you as possible to make a contribution to the various um, areas that we have um, we Christine and I have covered over in the last uh, half an hour or so and you will make a contribution and if you do then uh, the future of the institute over the next 20 20 years uh, is is assured so I'll uh, thank you for your attention thank you thank you very much um Bernard um, I wonder if anyone, there are some questions that we'll come back to in the Q&A. Um, we're ready for our speaker, Helen Apps, Professor Helen Apps Simon. So Helen, if you'd like to share your screen. Okay. Um, and over to you. Right. Okay. Is that clear and can people hear me? Yes, we can. Good. Okay. We can hear and see. Good. Okay. Well, let me start by saying thank you very much for making me an honorary research fellow. And I do feel very honored from an organization whose work I respect. And I just hope I can justify it. So today I've chosen to talk to you about an integrated approach to improving air quality, because through my career, I have been confronted with so many different aspects and so many different facets. Um, and it's a question of how we bring these together. So you will have to forgive me if, oh, it's not, sorry, somehow my, it's not pro progressing. Um, hold on, I'm going to have to have, come out. Have you got two screens? No, I've only got one and it's not progressing. Well, oh. enter work. Yep. Um, right. Thank you. I might have to sort of say, Go on. Right. So as you've heard, um, and I hope you will forgive me if there's a bit of an autobiographical flavour to this. I began my career, as many other people have done, with Gaussian plume modelling uh, in this, in my case, around nuclear power stations. But I recognise that those radioactive materials could travel continental distances. And we discovered that subsequently in the Chernobyl accident. 
And from that interest in transboundary pollution, I became involved in the work of the UNECE, which has moved on into my current work for DEFRA. So outline of what I'm going to talk about, obviously encompassing the different spatial scales, but I think as we've got 20 years of the uh, IAQM, I would look back at the last 20 years of the UNECE convention too, and see how that has changed in scope. And then I'll use that because that's the approach is the basis of what we've used in developing UK post-Brexit strategies for air pollution in the UK and the work we've been doing on setting targets for PM 2.5 with the Environment Act. And if we have time, um, a few little new aspects that we're looking at at the end. It depends whether you want to ask questions or go on to that. So the UNECE began really with the monitoring, the European Monitoring and Evaluation Programme, EMEP. And whether you're a modeler or measurements or whatever, you need consistent measurements. And this was what EMEP achieved across Europe. So that can be used to assess the current situation but it's also what you need for model validation and for observing changes over time. So it was this EMEP program that really started off when we realized that instead of uh, having rain that had a nice pH of about 5.5 and was clean, we were putting something down more like beer on our heads in large parts of Europe. And of course that had impact, that acid rain, but it was a big change because we were looking not at impacts on human health, but on biological impacts of air pollution. And moreover, it was complicated because it was particular areas that were being very hard hit, the Black Triangle, lakes in Scandinavia. And although it was initially attributed to sulfur dioxide emissions, it wasn't long before we recognized that that was not the only culprit, but NOx and ammonia were also a problem. So we were expanding all the time. And we had to bring in this very broad interdisciplinary expertise. We needed biologists and soil scientists to understand the problem and set criteria for protection, which recognize these different areas of Europe. And that was where we came up with the concept of critical loads, um, the maximum long-term annual deposition without causing adverse effects. And these critical loads were mapped varying spatially indicated in sensitive areas. And I think this was a very key thing because when you bring in different disciplines like this, each with their own areas of knowledge, you've got to establish an interface um, between groups of scientists. And I think this was a very good example. And it's been used to extend to indicators for crops, other ecosystems, forests, etc. cetera. Um, so I think that was quite a big step forward. And then we come to the modeling. Um, now, we started off with very simple Lagrangian models. Um, it still had to be validated against measurements, but the modeling brought in very much new dimensions. We could do sensitivity studies to the assumptions, um, the big variations in annual meteorology, um, and we could look at the future. So we started modeling future scenarios. The other thing was that models can be very useful for source apportionment. And I dug out this very old slide from the second sulfur protocol, the kind of embarrassing information that was presented to me when I went to UNECE meetings about how, how much sulfur the UK deposited on Norway as compared with what the Norway contributed to the UK. So those were budgets calculated with the old original EMET model. Now, of course, we have very much more advanced models extended to more pollutants and the improvements in atmospheric chemistry over the last 20 years have been fantastic, as has been the improvement in um, meteorological forecasting. And we now have these advanced Aurelian models. And then I think the contribution to working out the emissions, um, what we're putting into the environment that is causing all these problems and the development of the EMAP EEA guidebook. I think this was consistent approach needed for reporting for missions and input to models. We still haven't quite got it right. There's still problems like how to report, report PM emissions with their moisture content, but this has been an invaluable 
tool, I think, in knowledge transfers to countries that didn't have the experience. And we're now trying to think how we can expand this globally. And then what can we do about the situation? That's all the abatement measures and costs. It's fairly easy to identify the technological measures, the gas desulfurization, selective catalytic production, et cetera. But potentially there's a much wider range of measures. Um, so for example, with the second sulfur protocol, people change from burning coal to burning gas, but that wasn't the kind of thing we took into account in the protocol. We left it up to countries on how they achieve the emission reductions to meet the emission ceilings. So it should be easier than we actually say it is. What is really difficult is the behavioral change. It tends to be difficult because it's got much wider consequences than just air pollution. I mean, if you encourage walking and cycling, uh, you're improving human health, you're reducing congestion, uh, it interacts with lots of other things as well. And you're not really quite sure to what extent it will be taken up. So how we have to bring all this together, and this was really the birth of integrated assessment. And that involves bringing to, together the projected emissions into the future, what atmospheric concentrations and deposition that will give, the impacts both on health and on the environment, and what you can do about it with the abatement measures and costs. So it's bringing things together uh, right across the area. And we started off with three models, RAINS, CASM, and our own model, ASAM. And that's now become the GAINS model of IASA, recognizing this importance of the synergies between greenhouse gas control and air pollution. And the aim of this is develop cost-effective strategies and define a range for negotiation of national emission ceilings. So the illustration there, we could do much better than uniform percentage reductions across each country in emissions if we chose the um, measures in those countries that were really gonna make a difference uh, and forgot about the ones that weren't really gonna make any difference at all, zeroing in on the range where we were interested. So I think integrated assessment's been very effective it's led to the development of the Gothenburg Protocols, and you can see from this diagram the big reductions in emissions that they imply since 1990. It's covering a range of pollutants, the huge advances in atmospheric chemistry and atmospheric modeling. I gather the master chemical mechanism now has 19,000 reactions in it. And there's still things we don't know, like the intermediate um, volatility, VOCs, et cetera. Still lots to learn. We've looked at a wider range of effects on health, forests, natural ecosystems, and we've got these multi-pollutant, multi-effect protocols. So this integrated assessment approach has been very valuable, and it's now supported by this huge um, European-wide uh, organisation covering all the multiple effects, the emission inventories, the modelling, and leading to the integrated assessment. So. That's all I want to say about the UNEPE, but now I want to go on to how could we use this experience to develop a similar approach in the UK to support post-Brexit profit policy development. And we still need to keep our international obligations of complying with the emission ceilings, but we've got these new goals. So in the Environment Act, we have to set targets for reducing PM 2.5. And we have two targets added. Um, we had the original based on the number of people above a threshold, which is not a very good way of setting a target. Um, but we have two targets. One is the annual mean concentration target. And the idea of that is to set a maximum concentration um, to be reached by a future year. But in addition to that, we want to introduce population exposure reduction target, something that is going to affect everybody, reduce concentrations as much as you can everywhere and give health impact benefits for everyone. Um, what I'm going to be drawing on now, a lot of it has been uh, published in the evidence report for the consultation, um, but you might find some new stuff here as well. So 
we developed our UK integrated assessment model, UKIM. It's a very simple model. It puts together the projections, which are taking into account the energy projections, transport projections, agricultural projections, and that reflects net zero. That turns into emissions of the pollutants we're concerned about. We look at the abatement options, and we've had quite a lot of stakeholder groups to try and look at those abatement options. That turns into the pollutant concentrations and deposition, but we have to take into account the imported contributions from other countries and from international shipping. And then we can look at the population exposure and the health impacts, and also other impacts like um, ecosystems, forests, crops. And we've been using this model for DEFRA to look at scenario analysis up to 2050, and in particular to um, support the setting of targets for PM 2.5. I'm going to concentrate particularly on the PM 2.5 and NO2 part today um, because it's probably the most interesting. The difficulty with PM 2.5 is that it's a mixture and it includes lots of different contributions. So we have the natural contributions from sea salt, natural dust, from water. And then there's other bits that are not very easy to change, like the secondary organic aerosol which is dominated by biogenic sources and forests. So there's a large component that is insensitive to the emission reductions. Um, um, you'll note the map on the left. If we're thinking about the WHO revised guideline of five micrograms per cubic meter, the natural contribution itself is between the natural contribution itself is sort of up to four to five micrograms per cubic meter. So that doesn't leave really very much margin at all uh, compared with this new guideline. We have to look at the imported contributions. We look at the contributions from other countries using scenarios developed by IASA for the EU's second clean air outlook. Um, there are two of those, one more ambitious than the other. But we also have to look at shipping. And shipping, uh, there's a sort of ring of shipping around the UK where the estimated emissions are around about 660 kilotons of NOx, plus the emissions from the UK and at birth. So you can imagine that that actually contributes quite a lot to secondary on organic aerosol over the UK and to nitrogen deposition. So we've gone into quite a lot of modeling of the effect 2050, where we've got the emission control areas coming in in the English Channel and North Sea, but unfortunately that doesn't help in the Irish Sea. So international shipping is a problem. Within the UK, we distinguish around 90 different sources spanning different sectors, and we differentiate between England, minus London and London, and then the other uh, devolved administrations, Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland. And we use a simplified version with source footprints. So we have data from the frame model and our own modeling, which give us the response of concentrations to unit reductions in the emissions from the different sources. So that makes the model very quick to run. It runs in about half an hour or an hour. Um, and what we're mainly concerned about is the secondary inorganic aerosol, uh, which is a large proportion, but also the primary PM. And I think that has been the really new thing in this work. It's the first time we've really had to look into PM 2.5 in so much detail. And there are some very important sources like wood burning, non-exhaust traffic emissions, etc. And there are huge uncertainties in those emissions. And there's also missing sources like cooking. So we've had to undertake a lot of sensitivity studies to try and look at some of these uncertainties and questions. So now we finally get to a map of what the total PM 2.5 looks like in the UK in the base year that we've been working on 2018. And you can see that there's extensive exceedance of 10 micrograms per cubic meter. 
to the original WHO guideline. Um, there are hotspots, um, particularly in urban areas. And in London, they were over 13 micrograms per cubic meter in agreement with measurements. There's also a very strong gradient from southeast to the north, and that's largely influenced by imported contributions. But the local dispersion of primary particulate material enhances the urban concentrations, and that makes a big contribution to population exposure because of the concentration of people in those areas. The pie chart gives you an idea of um, how that population exposure is made up. You see the huge amount that comes from the natural the fixed background, and then you've got the contributions from the UK primary, which are comparable with the secondary, and then you've got the contributions from Europe and from shipping. Now, before we could use this model for policy, it had to be reviewed by AQUEG and considered to be a, a fit model for purpose. So first of all, comparison with measurements, which you can see on the left, but also comparison with other modeling. And we compared quite extensively with um, the more sophisticated Eulerian emet 4 uk model. You can see they really look quite good in agreement there, though we are a little bit more conservative in the improvements than the emet 4 uk model is. The other advantage of emet 4 uk is that it could explore into interannual variability and other things. Um, and it found that, you know, from using a bad year like 2003 for meteorology, your concentrations could be two micrograms per cubic meter higher on average. So we concluded we needed to allow for at least a one microgram per cubic meter uncertainty and to average over three years or more. Now I'm coming on to the scenario analysis we've done. We had to have a baseline, which was based on the National Atmospheric Emission Inventory projections with some adjustments for more recent updates. Um, and then we had two scenarios, two abatement scenarios, which were based on the workshops we'd had with uh, stakeholders to identify measures. The medium scenario where that was restricted to implementation of proven technology and with very limited behavioral change with fairly conservative timescales and uptakes. And then we had a high, more ambitious scenario, which was um, considering technologies that were likely to be implementable in the future uh, and with increased levels of behavior change and more ambitious in the rate of uptake of these measures. And then we had a speculative one, which was not really feasible, but um, based on all the feasible measures, uh, including emerging technologies that were not yet proven and significant behavior change with optimistic timescales and uptakes. We also did quite a lot of sectoral studies and um, looking at net zero scenarios, um, because obviously the interaction with the energy projections is a very important aspect. Um, I think you could see how effective some of these scenarios were by looking at the how the primary um, uh, emissions change in the different scenarios by 2040 on the right there. Now, some of these um, particularly road transport, for example, going through big changes uh, with electrification of the fleet. So detailed modeling of that um, on a, we, we have a sort of, um, oh dear, sorry, sorry, I'm just getting messages about my internet, internet connection is unstable. So I hope we're going to be all right. But anyway, um, we have a very detailed model of road transport. And you can see that as far as the NOx emissions are concerned in the top part of the diagram, they come down enormously. We've pretty well eliminated the NOx emissions by 2050 from electrification, but we still got the non-exhaust emissions and um, they are very important for the PM 2.5. So you see the little red bit there, which is the exhaust emissions, but then uh, the non-exhaust, and we don't really know 
quite what the effects of electrification with heavier vehicles, but regenerative braking will be. Coming back to the modeling, you can see how things improve over time. So even with the business as usual scenario, we're looking at a big improvement by 2030. But then even by 2040, you can still see that London's a problem and, and some of the other urban areas have still got little hotspots. London, um, that's important. It has the highest concentrations and that is the critical area for setting the AMCT, the, the target for the maximum concentrations. And just on the right hand side, you can see even with the speculative scenario, there's still areas at risk of exceeding 10 micrograms per cubic meter uh, in 2030. And by that time, just to make you realize how difficult it is, you're looking at sources like fireworks in the remaining emissions to try and control them further. So we considered hybrid scenarios with stronger measures in London than elsewhere, as well as the straight scenarios. So these are the example outputs for 2040. Um, which is the date we've set for the proposed targets. And you can see there that you've just about managed to get rid of the um, problem area with London um, and get everything pretty well green or mostly yellow. And that's um, really quite encouraging. When we're setting the annual mean concentration target, we look at the population exposure in exceedance of different thresholds. And then we um, calculate the, the population weight and weighted, weighted mean exceedance. Um, this means that we can compare different areas. So you can look at how much the exceedance is per person in say London as compared with England or in particular areas or urban areas. So we use that in setting targets and then we have slightly different traffic light matrix from the one that Bernard mentioned. Um, here we have on the left hand side the columns. That's the threshold going from 8 to 12 micrograms per cubic meter. And you have on the top row the 2030 scenarios, and on the bottom row the 2040 and 2050 scenarios. And really, if you are the red, anything that is red is very unlikely to be achievable. Um, and we're really looking to get to the green likely to be achievable to set the uh, AMCT. So you can see that um, this is really difficult to do in 2030. 10 is barely possible, even with a speculative scenario. Um, we have to go to 2040 to really feel that the 10 micrograms per cubic meter is likely to be achievable. We have the other target, the proposed um, exposure reduction target. And that I think is really quite ambitious. It's a 35% reduction by 2040 relative to 2018. Um, nice thing about that is that by taking a percentage reduction, you get a fairly even um, response. You get a similar reduction in London as you do in the rest of England. Um, and so, you know, everybody is benefiting really quite well in reducing their health impacts and exposure. But there are many uncertainties, um, particularly for things like the wood burning assumptions. When we are looking at how we're going to meet these targets, that's going to be based on measurements. So we have to consider, well, do we get some correspondence between the measurements and the modeling that is sufficiently good? So this was really just taking the measurements in different agglomerations and saying, if we calculate population exposure that way, do we get agreement with calculating population exposure in the modeling? And I think uh, this comparison here is really quite encouraging. Um, we aren't going to need to extend the measurement network quite a bit um, but I'm hopeful that this does make sense. We've had to look at the wider implications, obviously monetized health benefits based on the work of COMIAT um, from the improvements in PM 2.5 and NO2, but also looking at the other benefits, there's a reduced reduction in nitrogen deposition, which helps ecosystem protection. 
Um, then the costs of the measures and the cost benefit analysis undertaken by DEFRA. But there are also other things like um, the deprived areas. So the diagram on the right, um, looking at the different deciles of deprivation. So the most deprived people on the left-hand side of the diagram, the right-hand side is the least deprived. And interestingly, the people that are getting the highest exposure are not in decile one, but in deciles two and three. Decile one is largely um, in rural areas and uh, deprived areas there. And what we are finding is that these strategies, this is showing the deviation from the mean exposure in each decile group. And you can see that that um, disparity between the groups is decreasing as we go to the successively stricter abatement measures. That's more detail in the DEFRA report. So that's really what I wanted to say about the um, work we're doing on um, target setting. There's a lot of further work going on on uncertainty analysis. We're working now on interim progress towards the 2040 targets and really working in five yearly time steps towards the eventual attainment of those targets. There's input to the National Air Pollution, Air Pollution Control Programme. That is UK wide, whereas the Environment Act is for England. So that's including the devolved administrations. And because of, we're finding this big sensitivity to the net zero scenarios, we've got to do much deeper analysis on this link. Um, between air quality and the um, net zero. And we've just started a new contract working on future use of hydrogen, um, which I think is going to be very interesting. The other aspect that we're expanding on is the exploration to a wider range of future agricultural scenarios, because you've got these conflicting things from climate measures, wanting land use and changes in agriculture. And you've also got other changes possibly in diet and food production. So all these things are interacting. And um, I think there's quite a range of future agricultural scenarios, which if we get right, could benefit ecosystem protection. Now, that's really the end of my talk. There's, I've got a, two more slides, which um, are just something that I thought IAQM might be interested to take up. Um, it depends whether you'd rather ask questions or whether I think it might be this. worth. I think it would be worth pressing on with two more slides, he Helen. Right. Okay. Yes. Well, thank you. It, it's just that um, new issue we're looking at now. Um, we've always had problems with the modelling of NO2, and I think a lot of you in IAQM have had this problem too. Um, the emissions never seemed high enough uh, when you base them on COPET, as the NAI is. And so uh, we've been taking this new data from remote sensing of traffic emissions provided by David Carlsdor from the Duchem's project. Um, that's in the SPF Clean Air program. And that gives considerably higher emission, higher emissions than COPET does, um, especially for HDVs and buses um, and effects of older cars and generation. Also, it's showing much higher emissions at lower speeds, typical of urban conditions with stop-start conditions, which is not surprising. And we've been taking these data from David and putting them in our model, and it's improved our agreement between modeling and measurements of NO2 a lot. So I'll illustrate that here. Um, on the bottom, you've got our old modeling, uh, based on COPET with an under prediction of the NO2 and NOx concentrations and then using the remote sensing data we're much more spot on and it really makes a difference to the NO2 concentrations as you can see on the right hand side and looking into the future um, it's going to be with the EU suggesting a change to 20 micrograms per cubic meter as the limit value for NO2. Um, 
it, it would really make a, a huge difference. It's made a big difference to our national emissions of NOx from road transport. And um, at roadside sites, it's going to be an even bigger effect. So I imagine that's the, the sort of thing that you will be looking at in IAQM. Um, there's another interesting thing that's coming out of David's data in that he's got higher emissions of ammonia, particularly coming from petrol cars, that has an effect too. So this is a new issue that's just arisen in the last couple of months, really, um, which is something that I think our AQM might want to take up. So have any, any questions? Um, thank you very much, Helen. The, well, sorry, off to you. Thanks, thanks to my, I'd better thank DEFRA and my research group because they're a wonderful group. Tim, Hugh, Daniel, Adam and Elizabeth. <laughs> so thank you for listening. Thank you. That's, that's been very interesting. And there are some questions. Um, I'm not sure about the mechanics of whether you can come off mute, so I'll read them out. The first is from Roger Barrowcliffe. In the evolution of modelling for policy development, are we limited ultimately more by the uncertainties in emissions inventories or our understanding of how to simulate the dispersion and deposition process within the models? To some extent, it depends on the pollutant, but I would say that for particularly for the primary particulate, some of the uncertainties are very big indeed and are probably a bigger limitation. Um, you know, we're very aware that we make some simplifying assumptions, uh, linear assumptions in our simplified modeling, but the evidence we have from comparing with more complicated models indicates a much smaller effect than the effects of the uncertainties in the emissions. Does that answer the question? I think that does. Thank you. Moving on, Philip Branchflower, why 2040 and not extra measures in 2030? Yeah, I was expecting that question. <laughs> and as you know, the uh, EU has suggested 2030 um, for the 10 micrograms per cubic meter, but they have suggested a much less ambitious target for the population exposure reduction, only 25% instead of 35%. And I think that's probably the more difficult thing to achieve. I think um, I'm a bit, bit sceptical about the uh, EU setting 2030, because I think quite a lot of countries are going to exceed it. And I think it'll be rather like the NO2, oh, we'll give you a bit more time. Whereas the Environment Act, it's really a fixed legislation. We have to meet it. And we are not allowing for that kind of behavior. Does that answer it? I mean, most of the country uh, will achieve the 10 micrograms per cubic meter. It's going to be a few hotspots beyond that. Um, we may be lucky and achieve it, but we can't be sure. And that's why we need to set it at 2040. Yes. Uh, I mean, some EU legislation, it's not, it's not clear that the, that sort of mission creep that existed with NO2 would be repeated, but you're quite right to highlight it. Um, some EU legislation is successful at driving change on, on the appropriate timescale, but you're quite right to highlight that was uh, mm. very long drawn out. Right, next question. How do you account for exposure of people to account for any differences between outdoor and indoor air quality? We I assume that modelling is largely looking at predicting outdoor air quality. It's entirely on outdoor air quality. We haven't caught up with um, indoor air quality. The way we're dealing with exposure is extremely simple. It's just where somebody lives times the concentration modeled in the grid square in which they live. Um, so not even their movements throughout the day, which, um, I, yes, yes. I, I think you've got, to, on a national level, you can't really deal with that. And, and again, you know, how certain is it? Um, we do try to increase the, the sort of thing we're a bit more worried about is with the increase in population, um, how urban areas will develop. Will you get more concentrated development within the current boundaries of urban areas or will you get big expansion of urban areas and sprawl? So those sorts of things um, we think about, but we don't go into detailed treatment of exposure. 
thank you. Um, Ila Kilbane Dor, great talk, Helen. What sort of spread are you seeing within the remote sensing measurements? There's growing evidence of GEVs in large quantities. GEVs? G GEVs? Um, not sure what the. Gross emitting vehicles, maybe. Oh, yes. Okay. Yes, there are. Um, and of course, the HGVs are a problem. Um, there is a fix that um, people can buy and fix on their lorries um, to overcome the fact that they haven't got any ad blue. And I think it may be more widespread on the continent than it is in the UK, um, but it is something that we've really got to tackle. Um, mm. I mean, we are discussing this with DEFRA and DFT now. Thank you. Um, Paul Manctolo, did the UK IM PM 2.5 modeling consider future changes in emissions in Europe when predicting transboundary contributions in 2030 and 2040? Yes. Um, we base this on the work of IASA. Uh, so we looked at the, the work that was being done for the European Commission uh, on the clean air outlook. Uh, we took two scenarios, one with additional measures and the other a more ambitious uh, scenario um, with more ambitious um, greenhouse gas emission reductions. So we had two scenarios for emissions in other countries. I mean, obviously it's most important with what happens to the countries fairly near us, like France, the big countries like Germany. Um, but yes, we did take that into account and do sensitivity studies. Thank you. Um, Anna Grissino, thank you so much, Helen, for your presentation. Interesting to see PM 2.5 forecasts and compliance issues. I was wondering how non mapped emission sources, e.g. diesel backup generators, contribute to the increase of backgrounds in the future, large data centers, etc., since their emissions are not expected to decrease over the next 30 years, unlike traffic emissions. Interesting point there. I think this is one of the concerns we have about what's going to happen this winter. Um, mm -hmm. You know, when we get, uh, we haven't modelled it yet, but I was talking to IASA the other day, and they have done a very um, dismal <laughs> scenario looking at the current situation with uh, fuel poverty um, and all the Ukraine difficulties. We haven't done that yet. Um, Yes, it is a concern. Um, and, and this is where I say I still, still think there are missing sources that we haven't really considered enough. Um, cooking is one of them. Um, diesel generators are another. But this year, I think, is going to be crucial for the diesel generators. Yes, quite. Um, Sarah Legg. Hi, Helen. Thanks for a fascinating presentation. I think the impacts of some of the large scale net zero measures could either be fantastic or potentially disastrous for local and global air quality. Do you have any comment on this? I'd also be interested in how your work and conclusions compare to that beyond the UK. Thanks. Right. Um... Well, I mean, the way in which we go to net zero can make quite a difference. Um, if we go the CCS route, um, we're still emitting NOx. Um, you know, it may be reducing greenhouse gas emissions, but it's not necessarily reducing NOx. Um, if we go a different route, um, with more renewables. Um, this is why we're interested in the introduction of hydrogen at the moment um, to cover the storage problems um, so that we can have a greater reliance on renewables. Um, it, it, it can vary quite a lot with the net zero scenario on what happens to our air quality emissions. So that's why we're directing our work more in that direction now. Um, in comparison with other international work, um, 
we are obviously talking to other countries. And as I say, I had a discussion with IASA on Thursday on the work they are doing. Um, but I, not we, we, we will be using the UNECE fora too. We are hoping we're going to have more discussion between different countries on these synergies. And there's a Sotcha Barton meeting coming up in March where these things will come up. Um, but we probably haven't gone into such detailed comparison so far, simply because we've only just done the work. Okay, thank you. There are two final uh, questions. I'll take the last one first. Did this from Tim Williamson? Did the scenarios include controls in tire and brakeware? The Euro Seven proposals include these for the first time. Um, we had some in the more speculative scenario. We had some things that were looking more at the Euro Seven. Of course, Euro Seven hadn't been announced when we were doing this. Um, uh, we had things like um, last mile deliveries um, and trying to reduce emissions that way, um, some of the traffic reduction measures in. So we did, yes, we did have some of the measures, but more in the, in the speculative scenario. And as I say, there's still the uncertainty on what will happen to the non-exhaust emissions with electric vehicles, I think. I mean, regenerative braking, um, I think, can be quite helpful. Uh, but the brakes and tire wear, sorry, the tire wear and road wear um, are more difficult to control. And the data I've seen on tire wear is all over the place at the moment. So that's quite a difficult problem to resolve. Thank you. And then finally, just back to this indoor outdoor question, policy determined on purely outdoor air quality could completely miss the actual exposure of people in urban, particularly areas and improving outdoor air quality may have far less effect on exposure. Is there really no way to account for the relationship between indoor air quality and outdoor? I think at the moment the answer is no. I think we need a lot more work on it. Um, I, th I think there are certain sources that we can recognize would be common to indoor air and outdoor air. Uh, I've mentioned cooking as being a source that we think needs to be looked at more. Um, the way people cook and heat their homes. So to some extent, we may be thinking about that um, in parallel with how we change the way we heat homes um, and use energy in our homes but not beyond that in what we're doing at the moment. Thank you very much. I think we should wind up there. You've taken a lot of questions. So thank you very much indeed, Helen. Thank you for your-, your sharing. I, I, I didn't know whether to stop sharing before that my faith showed, but- uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you I also to- uh, Yes. Thank you also to Bernard for speaking about 20 years of IAQM and thank you to everyone for attending. So we look forward to seeing you at future meetings and um, having you involved in the work of IAQM. Over to you, Ethne. Thanks very much, Christine. Um, just to um, echo your thanks to everyone, um, Helen, Bernard and Christine yourself, um, thanks for your presentation today. I hope everyone enjoyed um, this AGM keynote speech um, and 20th uh, anniversary celebration. So thank you for joining. Um, just to let you know that the next IQM webinar will be on the 24th of January, um, and this will be on using model ensemble data to better understand climate risk. Um, and you can register for that on the IQM website. Thanks so much for joining and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Bye. Bye.